this week we're going to be looking at who is God, how does Jesus fit in? Uh, I, I saw someone had, had posted online this week where they were standing in line somewhere and they heard someone behind them talking about Jesus. And so that kind of perked their interest and they kind of eavesdrop in the conversation. And uh, the person said, Jesus isn't the Son of God. He was just a good magician. Well, my friends, if Jesus was just a good magician, he was also a liar. He was a charlatan. He was one of the biggest crooks the world has ever known. You say, whoa, that's kind of harsh to, to say about Jesus, isn't it? Well, it all comes back to the core issue of who God is and how Jesus fits in with who God is. We sang um, ancient words. We're going to go back and look and begin this morning with the most ancient words that we have in Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Because if we're going to understand who God is, we need to go back to the earliest thing we have about God when God is introduced to mankind, so to speak, if you will, in the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis is the first uh, of the books of law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, uh, which are, are the anchor, if you will, of Old Testament theology. It, it goes back literally to the very beginning. That's what Genesis means. It means beginnings. And in Genesis chapter 1, Verse 1, we see our first introduction, if you will, to God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, there's a number of names for God. And the first one that we see here is something that can be used uh, sort of as, as the generic term for God. It's the Hebrew word Elohim. And this particular word in this connotation means the supreme God. It's actually a plural form of another Hebrew word, and it is plural uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because it is uh, of the magnificent magnificence of it. Just like you and I have good, better, best. Um, the, the third is always the superlative, and the fact that it is the, the plural here is showing that it doesn't get more God than this God. Also, it could allude to the fact of the Trinity. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we see revealed throughout Old and New Testament. They are three distinct individuals, yet they are of the same essence. And we'll talk more about the Trinity uh, a little bit later on. But an important part of understanding who this God is is also understanding, uh, understanding what he did, how he did it. When it says here in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, there's a particular Hebrew word there for created. It is bara, and it is the, the uh, idea of creation out of nothing. When you and I create something, when you and I make something, we really aren't creating. What we are doing is we are manipulating. We are taking the elements, the materials that have already been provided and making something else out of them. Uh, God alone has the power of bara. God alone can create out of nothing. Uh, there's an old story about a professor who constantly uh, taught in class that he was as smart as God, he was smarter than God, he could do anything God could do, given enough time and enough research. And one day in class he even said that he believed that he could make a human being from dirt, just like God did. Well, at that point, God appeared in class in front of all the students and in front of the professor and told the professor, all right, I heard what you've been saying and you said that you believe that you can make a human being out of dirt just like I did. And the professor said, that is absolutely right. And he said, all right, well, let's go outside and we'll see how this works out. So God, the professor, and all the students walked outside and God said, well, I'll tell you what, since you're the one that, 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 that started all this, I'm going to let you go first. And the professor knelt down confident in his ability and his formulas and all that he had worked out that he was going to be able to create life out of this dirt. He reached down, scooped up a big handful of dirt to get started, and God said, uh-uh-uh, that's my dirt, make your own. <laughs> you see, you and I do not create. We merely manipulate. We take that which already is and make things. This is one of the, the, the ridiculous things about evolution that says that all of these things just sort of happen. 
It's like saying that this piano just sort of happened uh, uh, over the course of billions and billions of years. Wood and metal and all of these other elements came together in just the right form. And over the period of years, it eventually got into tune and came together into what we have as a grand piano. Now, my friend, when you look at this grand piano, there's something that is very obvious. That someone designed it and built it. When you and I look at creation, it is obvious that there is a design. I'm not going to go into all of the reasons why you can undercut evolution. I do not believe in evolution. I believe the Bible is very clear that God in His order of creation did things. I believe there came a time when God made Adam out of the dirt. I believe that exactly as it says to be because it is referenced throughout Scripture as literal. You say, well, now, preacher, let me ask you, does it really matter if I believe that, that God created the first man, or is it all right if I can't believe that God used evolution? My friend, the problem is the Bible doesn't say God used evolution. If God had used evolution, that's what the Bible would say. Instead, it says, from nothing, God created everything. Preacher, is it really that big a deal? Well, it depends on what you believe about God. You either believe God is sovereign and you believe God can do the things that His Word says it, He did or you believe you have to make excuses for it. Now people will say, well, you're small-minded, you're narrow-minded, you're, you're, you're naive to believe all that sort of stuff. My friend, I would rather err on the side of believing what God has given me than have to stand before Him one day and explain why I taught to people that we evolved out of jello. In Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that word means he didn't take something that already was. There was nothing, and he made it. That means, my friends, God created matter. Everything is made of matter. Everything, even the tiniest of molecules, has some degree of mass. God made all of them. And I believe that because the Word of God says He did. He is the most supreme God. He is Elohim, the greatest of all. And He created from nothing all that is. This particular Hebrew word, Elohim, appears over 2,600 times in the Old Testament. 2,600 times. Um, and it's frequently connected with another name of God that we'll see in just a moment. Now, there are a couple of occasions where Elohim is also used for false gods. It is also used for angelic beings. Uh, that is on a very rare occasion. And it would be similar in context to the differentiation between you and I use lowercase g God and uppercase g God. Um, but the overwhelming number, as I said, 2,600 times as opposed to uh, half a dozen. God is connected with this word. The significance of that. It is used to describe God in several ways. First of all, you see him described as creator. And you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, if you, you don't have to turn there real quick, but a couple of things I'm going I'm to look at. In, in Genesis chapter 5, you see the genealogy of Adam. It says, in the day, in verse 1 of chapter 5 in Genesis, in the day that God created man... He made him in the likeness of God. In verse 2, he created the male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. My friend, if you are going to believe evolution, you are going to have to disbelieve the Bible. That's all there is to it. Now, I know what science says, but my friend, science without God is not science at all. The science that is being forced on us today in our schools and in the Discovery Channel and all these other sort of things is a science that does not take God into consideration. There are many Christians out there, many believers, who look at science and include God and arrive at the same destination as the Word of God. You say, well, what about the Big Bang Theory? My friend, in essence what they've done with the Big Bang Theory is they couldn't figure out how everything got started, so they tried Genesis 1-1 without God. They said, in the beginning, the heavens and the earth. 
In the beginning, you had nothing, and all of a sudden, something happened, and nothing exploded and made everything. Well, you know what that sounds like? That sounds like Genesis 1-1. They've simply left God out of the equation. My friend, if you plug God and the Word of God into science, all of these questions, all of the missing links, all of the questionable time frames that the world has makes perfect sense. When you eliminate God as creator, you have eliminated God. Because you cannot separate the creation event from God. You cannot separate His authority. You cannot separate His power. You cannot separate His creativity in all of this and still arrive at an understanding of who God is. God is creator. God is king. We see throughout Scripture this tied to the idea of Him being King and Judge and Lord and Savior. And we'll look at some of these others in just a moment. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, I want you to see that there's another word that is used for God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says, This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. The, the Lord that we translate it is the Hebrew word Yehovah. And we think that's the correct pronunciation of it, and I'll explain why in just a minute. It is connected to this eternal national name of God is connected to when he introduced himself to Moses as I am. I am. It speaks of this eternal nature. In Revelation chapter 11, 17, you you see the idea of the one who was and is and is to come or will always be. It is the eternal, constant nature of God. Now this word that we translate the Lord, Jehovah, is often used in connection with God's redemptive work. Now the reason I say I hope that we're pronouncing that right is because up until about the time of the Renaissance, Uh, You did not have that complete word written out. What you had written out uh, were the consonant, the equivalent of what we would have, Y-H-W-H. And why did they do that? Because they considered the name of God, which Jehovah is considered his covenant name, if you will. They considered it too holy to write. It was too holy to speak. Uh, that's why if you've ever seen, even today, you'll have, have some, uh, uh, some Jews who will not write God, they'll write G-D. Because it's the same idea of the connotation that His name is, is too holy to speak, is, is too holy to even have written. And so there was a, another name for God, Adonai, and the vowel sounds were, were taken from that because of the similarities to it and, and, and plugged into Jehovah, thinking that perhaps that was as close as it was. But really, we're not sure because they left it out. Because it wasn't to be said. It wasn't too written to be written. It was Holy, But you often see Jehovah and Elohim together, the Lord God. And it is used in that context to show His eternal supremacy. And you say, preacher, this is an awful lot of information just on, on, on God and on a couple of words that are used for Him, isn't it? Yes, it is. You may have come in here today thinking you knew a lot about God. But my friend... God cannot be contained by just one word. He cannot be contained in just one concept. That is why there are so many names for Him in Scripture. And all of these things go to try to describe His nature. It is an attempt to describe the indescribable. It is an attempt to reconcile the irreconcilable. You and I cannot figure out God. You and I cannot grasp His greatness and His holiness. Our culture today, the name of God has become just something else that floats around out there. More frequently than not, it's used as a cuss word than it is anything else. You can say it in that context, but you better not say it in any other, or the ACLU will come after you. Now, with that sort of light view of God in our culture, it becomes even more important to understand the names of God in Scripture, because God is holy. If God's name was considered too holy to speak and too holy to write, what does that say about our usage of God's name today? 
not only our usage of God's name, but our allegiance to Him and our obedience to Him. We often see Jehovah attached to other descriptors. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider, other sort of things like this are associated with Him, showing His greatness, showing that He gives everything that can possibly be needed. Turn with me over to Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, you see that Moses has been living out in the wilderness for a few decades. He'd grown up in Pharaoh's house, a Hebrew child found by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in Pharaoh's home, saw himself trying to protect one of his fellow Israelites from an Egyptian who was mistreating them, and yet they turned on him as well, and he, was, he had to flee for his life. Decades go by, and God's time clicks on until it's such a time for Moses to carry out God's purpose. God comes to him, and in chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 13, Moses said to God, as he's going along and God's told Moses, I want you to do this. I want you to go and you're going to lead my people out of their bondage in Egypt. Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? God, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This Hebrew word that is translated I am is basically an emphatic statement of existence. It is that is, has been, always will be. It is a picture of that constant nature of God. My friend, God is no different today than he was in Genesis 1.1. He will not be any different at the end of Revelation chapter 22 than He is today. God does not get weaker. God does not get older. God does not compromise. God does not change His mind. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says there is no shadow of turning with Him. That is why. Why do we need to know that? That is why when God tells you and I something, when He makes us a promise It cannot be broken. It will stand forever because God cannot go back on His Word. His Word is as eternal as He is. In the Greek, there's also a similar word that conveys that same thing that Jesus Himself used when He referred to Himself as I am. The word Adonai is another word, translated Lord many times. And it's a term of of deference, that you you would would humble yourself before them. This word came to be used more frequently uh, than than Jehovah later because of of the, the, the holiness of that name, of Yahweh. Uh, They wouldn't use that, so they would use this instead, this other form that we translate Lord. Again, why is this so important? Because, my friend, if you and I mess up who God is, we've messed up. If you and I do not grasp His holiness and His power, and that is why, my friends, I've heard a lot of Christians over the years say, well, preacher, you know, I... uh, You know, I, I don't know that I necessarily believe all of Genesis. I think that God probably used evolution a little bit. Well, well, at what point do you, how much of a little bit of evolution do you believe God used? I mean, where in the primordial ooze to you and I today, uh, where, what do you believe? At what point do you suddenly decide, oh yeah, this is, this is the point that I need? It's a sliding scale and a slippery slope, my friends. If you and I are not careful, When you begin questioning this passage of Scripture, when you and I begin saying, well, I'm not sure that that's right, where do you stop? And when you begin doubting Scripture, where do you draw the line from doubting the God who gave us this? The Bible tells us, my friends, that all Scripture is inspired. God breathed. It is directly from God. So, my friends, either God is telling us the truth and we can believe it, or the whole thing's a lie. So there's a few names of God that help us to get a sense of His holiness. 
His power, there's none that creates like Him. His majesty, His eternal nature. So that's God. So where does Jesus fit in? Well, maybe you're like that guy that was saying that Jesus wasn't the Son of God, He's just a magician. Or maybe you're like a lot of people in the world that say, well, Jesus was, he wasn't the Son of God or God in the flesh or anything. He was just a good teacher. He was a prophet and he was a, he was a good person. He did good things, but that's all he was. My friend, you've missed what the Bible says about him as well. Who is Jesus? First of all, Jesus is Messiah. Messiah. In the Old Testament, we see that there was foretold Messiah would come, that he would set his people free. Daniel, uh, in, in the, one of the prophecies of Daniel, we see this in Daniel chapter 9. You, you have the concept of Messiah. Who is Messiah? Messiah is the consecrated one. He is the anointed one. He is the one who is to come and, and fulfill a purpose. The Jews understood uh, throughout their history that there would come a day when Messiah would come and deliver them from their oppressors. Now they were looking when Messiah came for a military ruler who would come and set them free and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and reign and rule and, and everything would be fine after that. The problem is they were skipping far too far ahead. We see in the book of Revelation that one day that is exactly what will happen. But when Messiah came the first time, he would come as a suffering servant. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, in the middle of this prophecy that we're actually going to be talking about in our study on Revelation on Wednesday night, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... Messiah the Prince. You have this picture there of this anointed one, this, this Christ that meant christened one, uh, that he would come as royalty. But he would not be fully revealed. And that's what caused so many of the Jews to become confused. Jesus came claiming to be uh, Messiah. The anointed one, the Christ, the promised one who would come and deliver the people. But they were looking for physical deliverance, whereas Jesus came to bring spiritual deliverance. I have to do a lot of counseling as a pastor. I do marital counseling. I do people call and they've got a problem or a difficulty. And, and I'll talk with them or I'll meet with them or any number of things to try to help them with the situation they're going through. But I can't tell you, my friends, how many times I've discovered and helped them to discover that their problem is not primarily physical. Their problem many times is spiritual. They are neglecting a spiritual element of their life and yet they are trying to solve that spiritual problem with physical things. That's why so many people become addicted to any number of behaviors or substances because they are trying to mask or hide or solve a problem or do something else when that is not the solution. Physical solutions are at best temporary. Whereas the spiritual solution that Jesus offered, forgiveness from sin, freedom from judgment, eternal relationship with God, is the solution that all of mankind needs. And that's what Messiah was coming for. He was coming for that spiritual liberation that only Messiah could bring. We also see there's a Hebrew word for Savior. A Greek one also, we see that it was translated, the Hebrew word yasha has this, this connotation of absolute, again, absolute Savior. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11, he says, I, even I am God, and beside me there is no Savior. That word is Jehovah there. I, so in other words, I, even I, Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. In Hosea chapter 13, verse 4, we see almost the same thing. You shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. The world absolutely goes insane and bonkers when you and I say, the Word of God says Jesus is the only way to heaven. He is the only way to be saved. There is no way to the Father except through Him. They call us narrow-minded. They call us bigoted. They go down the list of all the things that we we are. But the fact of the matter is, my friend, God says time and time again throughout His Word that there is no one who saves 
but Him. He is the Savior. There is no other Savior. There is no other way. You and I must understand that as human beings, we want to solve all of our own problems. We are fixers, especially guys. We are fixers. We want to find out what the problem is and we want to fix it. And when you go to see a counselor, you want to go see that counselor and you want that counselor to fix that problem. You want them to tell you what to do. When people call me or they come see me or I go see them, I can't tell you how many times they leave frustrated and aggravated because I have not been able to give them a magic pill they can take that will make their problems go away. I've not given them a magic Bible verse that they can memorize and they can quote and say anytime they need it, suddenly that problem will be gone. My friends, That's not how it works. God will use our difficulties. He will use our trials and our tribulations to build us up, to teach us, to draw us closer to the Messiah. But we need to understand, my friend, there is nothing that can save us apart from Christ. That is why Messiah came. That is why He died on that cross, to pay for our sins and to purchase our place in heaven. Listen, Jesus is Messiah, He is Savior. If He is not the Anointed One, the Christ, if He is not the Savior, then why did He come? We did not need just one more prophet. We did not need just one more teacher. We did not just need one more nice man. We needed atonement. We needed someone who could save us Pay for our sins and purchase our place in heaven. Because the Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats, the sacrificial system, would never be enough. But it required the sacrifice of a Savior, a Deliverer. The Greek word that we translate Savior literally means Deliverer. Deliverer. We needed someone who could come and take us where we needed to go. We needed someone who could make a way when there was no way. Have you ever fallen or gotten down on the ground and you couldn't get yourself back up? Happens more as time goes by, doesn't it? And I say that as sort of a warning because we're supposed to have some nasty weather here in the next couple of days, so... Those of you who think you're still as agile on ice as you used to be, be careful. Those of you who think, I can do it, even my parents can't, but I can do it. We don't need any teenagers in the hospital either, because ice is merciless. It knows no mercy, and it will throw any of you on the ground. And the thing with being on ice and falling on ice is not only the, the embarrassment of falling down, but then the embarrassment of trying to get back up. You know, that's why I don't like ice skating. I used to roller skate all the time. You know, quads, the wheels at the corners, not in line, that's messed up. But the roller skates here, on, you know, the way they should be. And I had speed skates. And, buddy, every Sunday afternoon from 2 to 5, I'd be at Starlight Skate Center in Norman Beach. And I'd be tearing it up to my Sharona. <laughs> every time I hear that song, I see, still see disco balls and flashing lights. Like having a seizure. But when you fall on roller skates, you know, I I got to where I didn't fall much. And when I did, you know, the whole thing about falling is looking cool when you get up. You can't look cool when you fall ice skating. So the first time I went ice skating, I thought, well, I can roller skate, so I can handle this this ice skating stuff. Nothing to... And then you're down, then you try to get up. See, I've got a rule now as an adult that I told Leanne years ago. That if as an adult, if I ever trip and fall... Stay down. Act like you're unconscious. If I have a trip coming up the stairs, folks, and I go down, just give me a minute. Somebody come help me up because that's my rule. Why? Because it's hard to get yourself up after you fall. And if you do it on the ice, it's almost impossible. And then you have your friends come along and try to get get them get you up or they fall and you try to get them up and you all wind up in a pile on the ice. Why? Because it's slippery. You can't get traction. And, and, and you need somebody else that's got better traction than you to help you get up. 
You see, my friends, all of us have fallen on the slippery surface of sin. Every one of us. The Bible says we're all down. And the only one with attraction to get us up is Jesus. That's why he came. See, my brother, who's about nine years older than me, was one of the skate guards at the skating rink. And Todd could skate backwards better than I could skate forward. He was the best roller skater I've ever seen. And back then, the skate guards actually wore referee jackets. You know, had the black and white stripes and had a whistle. I mean, it was the 70s. Come on. You know, I mean, we all were, you know, listening to Cool and the Gang and Earth, Wind, and Fire and my Sharona. But somebody would fall, and Todd's job was to watch. And, I mean, there'd be hundreds of people roller skating. Again, this is 1979, 1980, anyway. Hundreds of people at the skating rink. And my brother's job was to be sure that if somebody fell, he got over to where they were as quickly as he could and sort of blocked the way. So he could then help them get up. And I was always so proud of Todd because I was like, that's my brother. He's the skate guard. <laughs> Nowadays, Todd would be really embarrassed that I'm telling everybody he's the skate guard. But, uh, but there he was, and, and I'd see, and somebody would fall on the other side, and psh, it'd be a black and white stripe blur, and get over there. And he'd blow the whistle, you know, and everybody kind of clear out, and he'd get around them. And Todd could actually. I, I, I tried to do it. I never got where I could do it. He could angle his feet kind of like that, and he could just go in perfect circles around somebody. I mean, he didn't, didn't look like he even moved. It was like the, they, he had motors on his wheels, and he just circled them, you know? I always thought that was the coolest thing. But he would stand there and would circle them and give them a minute to kind of compose himself if they needed it, you know, because when you're on wheels, it's kind of hard to get up too. And Then he'd reach down, and he'd get them up, and then they'd be on their way. See, my friends, what Jesus does for you and I is he offers us a hand up. And there comes times when he puts a circle around us. And he'll isolate us, so to speak, from the things of the world only for a few moments. And he'll offer his hand to us. I saw plenty of people take my brother's hand and let him help him up. But I saw plenty of people who'd say, no, I'll get myself up. I'll get up myself. I'll be all right. Just give me a minute. <laughs> Today, my friend, Jesus may be circling you. And perhaps he's reaching his hand out to you, saying, here I am. You can't get up from where you are because that's sin. But I'll help you up if you'll let me. You say, well, why does Jesus have to put a circle around us? Because, my friends, the Bible makes it very plain. Satan and the world does everything it can to drown out the voice of the Savior. And our days get busier every day that goes by, doesn't it? If you have more to do, more responsibilities, more things clamoring for your attention, more things piling on you, more voices in the world trying to get your attention. And yet perhaps now, in this moment, you have a clarity that you've never had before. And in this moment, you can almost hear Jesus saying, come to me. Let me help you. Let me tell you what will happen if you're not careful, my friend. That moment will pass. And in your pride and your arrogance and your ego, you'll say, no, 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 I can do it myself. I'll get up. Or give me just a minute and I'll let you help. I'll let you help me up if I can't get up myself. My friend, let me give you a shortcut there. You can't get up yourself. That's why the Savior came. He's the Christ, the anointed one. In Matthew chapter 16, we see that term applied to him. In Jesus chapter uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, rather, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples, and saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah the prophet. Others say Jeremiah or another one of the prophets. And Jesus asked this question, But who do you 
say that I am. Simon Peter in verse 16 answered and said, You're the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, my friends, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who anybody else says Jesus is. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? A magician? A good man? A good teacher? A prophet? Or do you believe him to be part of the Trinity, all equally God, eternal, all-powerful, creator, provider, savior, messiah, anointed one, deliverer. Who do you say Jesus is? Right now, you've got a chance you've said one of those wrong answers to change your answer the Bible tells us whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered saved my friend all you have to do today is recognize that the unknowable unfathomable God has reached out to you and through the death Messiah on the cross and through his resurrection you and I have a way up from sin from wickedness from unrighteousness that we could never get up from on our own so well, how do I know that how can I believe that because the Bible says so well how do I know the Bible's right my friend how do you know there's going to be air there for your next breath you say, well, it's been there in the past. My friend, we have thousands of years of miracles, changed lives, changed hearts, and things that cannot be explained away. Every prophecy of the Old Testament came true. Every single one. Jesus died and on the third day from that rose from the dead by his own power you say well how do we know that he is risen because my friend think about this Simon Peter the leader of his disciples the most vocal outspoken go-getter fired up guy that Jesus had the night before he was crucified, the, during the trial before he was crucified, denied him to the point of cussing somebody out that he didn't know Jesus. They feared for their lives. But a few days later, they're willing to risk their lives and proclaim Jesus risen. If the disciples went and got the body... That just doesn't make any sense. First of all, they wouldn't be able to get past the Roman guards that were stationed there. You say, well, if the disciples didn't have the body, maybe the, the Jewish leaders got it. Well, that doesn't make any sense either. The Jewish leaders wanted him dead. They sure didn't want anybody thinking he'd coming back from the dead. If the Jewish leaders had Jesus' body, they'd have said, he's not alive. Here's his body right here. The Romans didn't have it because they would have done the same thing. My friend, the only explanation for the changed lives of the disciples, the only explanation for the empty tomb is that Jesus was who he said he was. And he rose from the dead on the third day. And he ministered in front of hundreds of people after his resurrection. As the scriptures say, basically if you don't believe me, some of the writers say, ask the people who saw it because they were still alive at the time these letters were written and he was sended back to the right hand of the father and he's coming back one day how do we know he's coming back because everything else the bible said has been fulfilled and you can count on the fact based on the past that the future is just as sure my friend it is far more unsure for you 
to run from God than it is for you to trust God. Well, but I can't see him. I can't hear him. How do I know that he's there? You'll know when you're a believer. I could probably have a parade of believers come up here and stand at this microphone and tell examples of how they know God is real and God is alive because they've experienced him, because they've seen him. They've walked with him. They've felt him. They've seen his handiwork in their lives. You don't see the wind, but you know it's there. My friend, what you need to do today is you need to trust in the eternal God, provider, king, the deliverer, because he has done all that he has done because he loves you. That's John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, today, your sin problem can be solved by the creator. The one who made all things has made a way for you. If you'll take the hand, the deliverer is offered.